worship our King. Amen. Let's all stand together this morning as we worship. We lift our voices. We sing together. We've waited for this day. We're gathering your name. Let me hear you sing, Hope. Waited for this day, we gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. Sing, you're the reason. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're serving. Presence in this place, your glory on our face. We look into the sky, descending like a cloud. You're standing with us now, Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason, you're the reason we're here. You're the reason, you're the reason we're singing. Open up the we want to see you open up the floodgates a mighty river flowing from your heart filling every part of our praise sing open up the heavens we want to see you open up the floodgates a mighty river that you give in our lives. We sing about his amazing grace today, Hope. Grace that gives us more than we could imagine, that we don't deserve, that God gives graciously without holding back. Say a wretch 
like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see so clear you for who you are. God, we give you all the honor and all the glory today, for there is no one else who deserves our praise, only you. And God, we open our hearts and we lay them before you as an offering. God, we thank you for working in our lives and we ask you to continue to do it. Father, we come to you humbly, just how we are knowing and trusting that you don't expect us to have it all together. You don't expect us to come to you as anything other than just what we are. So we come honestly and humbly, and we thank you for accepting us and for hearing us. We pour our hearts out to you, and we cry out. We love you, and we sing our praise in your name, Jesus. Oh, 
a pie in a mother's cheese in the dead of night. Better than a hallelujah sometimes. God loves the trumpets cry, the soldiers plead not to let him die. Better than a hallelujah sometimes. Just his melody, beautiful the mess we are, the honest cries of breaking hearts. Are better than a hallelujah. Woman holding on for life, the dying man giving up the fight, a better than a hallelujah sometimes. The tears of shame for what's been done, the silence when the words won't come, a better than a hallelujah sometimes. We pour out our miseries, and God just hears a melody. Beautiful, the mess we are, the honest cries of breaking hearts are better than a hallelujah. greatest display of love the world had ever seen came from Jesus Christ. Knowing that we would never be able to perfectly follow the law, God made a plan to send grace, to keep truth, and to send grace, and to save his people. And through the sacrifice, the body and the blood of Jesus, Every person is free to choose grace and to choose life. Before he gave himself, Jesus initiated and displayed the first communion. And he told his disciples to break the bread that he blessed and to drink from the cup. And he asked them to do it in remembrance of him. So as a family of believers, we take communion. We do it as in obedience. We do it as an act of love. And we do it to remember what Christ gave on our behalf. He gave what we never could. 
and we are free to live and free to love. You are free to take communion here. The belief in your heart that Jesus gave his life for you, that he conquered death and he rose from the grave and you will live with him forever is all you need. I encourage you to take communion how you feel comfortable at any time during this next song, how you were shaped for worship. If you didn't receive the elements on your way in, just raise your hand and God and uh, our ushers will bring you whatever you need. We celebrate and remember as a family. We remember our friend and our brother. And we remember our Savior and our King, Jesus. No, no. Reaches to the heaven in your faithfulness stretches to the sky. like a mighty mountain yeah. and your justice flows like the ocean's tide and I will live my voice to worship And I will find my strength in the shadows of your wings. Your love reaches to the heaven. Stretches to the sky Your righteousness Is like a mighty mountain yeah. And your justice flows
Let me try that again. Hey, Hope Church, you glad to be here today? <laughs> Thanks for joining us today, both online and in person. Two locations, one church. It's been a great week. Uh, we've had our, our groups meeting, uh, growth groups and men's group, women's group. Um, we've had uh, good things going on with fellowship. We had the men's breakfast yesterday, archery ministry. And the city has... Uh, our Johnny Appleseed days going, so that's been cool to see uh, big crowds here on the ridge. And uh, so we're thankful that you're here with us today. We're in a series, a campaign, looking at life's healing choices. Last week we began in this study of the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that was the reality choice where we realize I'm not God, admit I'm powerless to control my tendency to do wrong things, and my life is unmanageable. That's a scary word, that word admit, isn't it? Where we just admit. That's why it's called the reality choice, where we're honest. And we're going to see that the, the word recovery is used as an acrostic for these eight lessons that we're going to go through. Uh, Tom Holliday who's a teaching pastor down at Saddleback in Southern California, he says, I think a lot of people view the recovery series like going to the dentist. You know, you walk into the dentist, and they always lay out all those metal tools right there by you, you know, and kind of like saying, we may be using all these on you, you know, and you, you sit down, and your mouth is open, and they talk to you and even ask you questions, and you're like, uh-huh, and somehow they act like they can understand you, and um, it's, it's, it's not fun. There are some people who say, oh, I don't mind. I take a nap. If you take a nap at the dentist, you're sick. But uh, just kidding. But uh, really, most of us, I think, we view it as I just want to get in there and get out of there. And Holiday's point is that's how a lot of us approach a series like the recovery series. Let's just get it over with. Let's get through it. Uh, but really, he says we should view it, uh, view it more like unlocking the prison door. And uh, maybe some of us understand that if you're inside and when the prison door, the jailhouse door is open, it's a happy feeling. I heard that from a friend. And uh, <laughs> you're free. And that's what this is about. Freedom, not a guilt trip. It's all of us working together with God, growing together. So today it's about the hope choice. And there's E. The E in recovery stands for earnestly earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to Him, and that He has the power to help me change. That word change scares us. But we, we don't struggle so much, most of us, with believing that God exists. But you've got to take the whole statement that God, I earnestly believe there's a higher power, it's God, and we believe Jesus Christ is the, the Son. I mean, we believe in the the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Father God. And He exists and we all matter to Him and He has the power to help us change. Matthew 5.4 is the beatitude for this week. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Mourning? I don't want to choose mourning as the path of happiness. But He, he says that is the way for us to find Comfort from God. We all like comfort. I want comfort, but mourning? And I don't want to mourn my past or my present things that I'm struggling with or the mistakes I make or the things that have happened to me. I don't want to just mourn. God says uh, to open up, to be real. I'm broken like we said last week. And then to mourn. And now I'm on a track for comfort, lasting comfort. We want to fix and find comfort and hope through a quick fix, not a process. We want alcohol because it numbs us and feels so good and we get happy. Or we want the drug of our choice. Or it can even be our prescription drug or somebody else's that we find in the medicine cabinet. We, we may like gambling because we get a, a rush from going there. It's temporary, but we get a rush. Or some like shopping to try to find comfort 
uh, and maybe even when they don't have the money to afford what they buy. It just feels good momentarily. Some are preoccupied with sex. Sex is a beautiful thing God created for us to enjoy, but he doesn't uh, want us to be so focused on it, it becomes our God, and it is the way we find happiness or illicit relationships or pornography. Uh, others take um, entertainment. I don't mean watching a game or enjoying something here and there, but I mean constantly immersed in the TV. Entertain me, entertain me, entertain me. Others try to find comfort and self-pity. That's where you walk in and you close the door and you close the blinds and it's dark and usually involves a lot of chocolate and you, ha you throw a pity party and invite yourself. Others, uh, it can be anger. I can just find comfort some weird way in controlling everybody, making people tiptoe around me and that's the way I try to find comfort by being in control and anger. Or it can be food. Oh, it's so good and it makes me feel comfortable. And, uh, or it can be work where you just work and work and work and work and hopefully you work so hard till you're so tired you can go to bed and go to sleep and then get up and do it again. Our path to comfort and hope is often escape. The word escape. Escape to a path for quick comfort and a hope that doesn't last. The problem with all these things, we're all human and struggle with different things, uh, but they provide a momentary escape at best. It gives me no comfort in the end. It leaves me addicted because I'm going to need more and more and more, though I never can quite get enough for that comfort I want. The truth is, a comfortable life will not comfort your soul. You and I need something bigger something only God can give. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Jesus is radical. Jesus teaches happiness upside down. Jesus says the deepest happiness and blessings in life are often from the things that I, want, I least want to be a part of my life, things I would never choose for my life, but it's not just a matter of having bad things happen in our life. It's a matter of choosing, it's a choice, choosing to mourn, choosing to accept those things that have happened, to realize that this world does not hold the hope that I need, and to look to God for the comfort that only He can give. Lord, I don't want to mourn, but I do want to be comforted. But God says mourning is the only path to his comfort, admitting what I don't have, admitting what I've lost, admitting what is not there is the path to realize what I have in God and what he can give me when no one else can. How does it work? How does this path to comfort and hope with God uh, come about? Let's look at that today. A few simple points. Number one, I have to see who God really is. The way we view God impacts the way we live, impacts our attitude, our hope. It's where it starts. You see who God really is. I know that I can trust God to comfort me if I see Him for who He really is, as in the Bible. It's not comforting if I think God is out to condemn me. I'm thinking all the time, uh, God's thinking, would you get it right? Would you get it right? And uh, you, you have that in the back of your mind all the time. God is watching over your shoulder, always looking for you to mess up so He can tell you how you messed up and how messed up you really are. You may uh, be new to church, or you maybe are just coming back to church, or maybe you've been going to church all your life, but you still can struggle with this. And you got to hear this today, that God's not out to get you. It has to do with something that happened to you in your past. It may have been a Christian leader gave you a picture of a mad God uh, that is mad at you and guilted you. Or it was someone you looked up to as a Christian and they gave you this picture of God and you better get it right and God's conditional is the way they treat it. Even if they wouldn't say that, 
God is mad at you. Until you get it right, he's not going to accept you or love you. He's a condemning God. He's all about judgment. If you feel that way, what are you going to trust? Your feelings? Or are you going to trust the event that changed human history when Jesus Christ walked on this planet and he lived that life for, to show us how to live and then he went to the cross and died for our sins and then what we call Easter happened, the resurrection. It, that is all about God telling you he is not out to condemn you. Romans 8, 34. Who then will condemn us? Will Christ? No, for He's the one who died for us and came back to life again for us and is sitting at the place of highest honor next to God, pleading for us in heaven. Someone here today feeling that God is mad at you, you need to hear this today. Jesus came to this planet and lived a life for you to show you how to live in a relationship with the Father. Jesus went to a cross and He died for you. And He rose from the grave to prove that He can overcome death. And He came to bring you into a relationship with Him and with the Father. When you see that, when you get to a point in life where you begin to see that, you can think, maybe my feelings aren't right. Maybe my feelings aren't reality. It's kind of like you can go into a dark house and somebody says, um, ooh, this is, this is scary in here. And, uh, you know, this is spooky. And you start getting afraid. And every little noise, every little creaky sound you hear, somebody's out to get us. There's a boogeyman in here. There's a ghost in here. You get scared because your feelings have been told a lie. And you believe that lie. If you're feeling like God is mad at you to condemn you, Jesus came to earth for you, and He died for you, and He rose for you, and He's now pleading for you at the right hand of God. Who are you going to trust? Your feelings or Christ? Who is God? What is God really like according to the Bible? The psalmist in Psalm 86, 15 says, But you, O Lord, are compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. He is compassionate about your hurts and your hang-ups and the struggles in your habits and mind. He's compassionate about us. You might run these statements in your mind over and over that you've believed for a long time. You're stupid. You'll never amount to nothing. You, just, you can't get it right. You've got to get it right. And you've got to change those statements. That's what uh, life's healing choices are all about. Listening to the Word of God and making choices to believe the statements that are rooted in the Word of God and the feelings can follow as we believe the real truth about God. If we're going to experience life's healing choices, we've got to rewrite those statements in our minds. We may have heard them from our parents. We may have heard them from a teacher or a coach or, or someone uh, negative in our life. Churches can guilt trip you. It's in our lingo. You weren't a church. You weren't a church. Why weren't you at church? We missed you at the meeting. We missed you at the gathering. How much are you reading your Bible? How much are you praying? And instead of uh, gathering to be positive. It's a gathering to take attendance. Who's not here? And the preacher talks about who's not there. And the people that are sitting there are like, well, we're there. We're here. <laughs> Talk to us. And you don't see that with Jesus. He never complains about attendance. It gets on to people who didn't show up. He has a powerful time with whoever shows up. Churches are, 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 are as big as anybody on guilt trips sometimes. It goes all the way back to the day of Jesus, this blind man. Who sinned? He or his parents? Jesus says, nobody. Neither. He says, this guy is born blind so that he can show the work of God. There were people that even his parents, that saw Jesus heal the blind man, but they still didn't want to be thrown out of their synagogue. They'd rather go to their guilt trip synagogue with their tradition and their misery and be comfortable in that than to accept who Jesus Christ was in front of their eyes. 
If we're going to experience life's healing choices, we've got to rewrite these statements that are all about guilt and shame and condemnation. Listen to this. God is not here to condemn you. He's a compassionate God. He cares about your hurts. He cares about your habits. He doesn't look at you and say, why haven't you got, gotten over that yet? He looks at you and he says, I can help you. I want to help you as you go through this. I am compassionate. I understand what you're, you're walking through and what you're going through. He's a compassionate God. You say, yeah, but I'm conservative. And the Bible talks about obedience and judgment. I'm conservative too. And it took me a while to figure it out. It takes more strength than to be a lover, to be full of grace, to be forgiving, to accept forgiveness even though I know I don't deserve it. That is the gospel. That is grace. It's not me trying to get all good, good enough to get myself into heaven. Look how good I am. Who is God? What is God about? 1 Corinthians 1.3 Listen to the Bible. God is the Father who is full of mercy and full of comfort. You may have grown up with a father who was full of judgment or distance from you or not even around. Don't put that on God. That's not who God is. God isn't that Father. God is a perfect Father. He's full of mercy. He's full of comfort. This is the God you want to have that relationship with. Somebody needs to hear this today. I know it. I've been around this gig all my life. I even took a break in guilt and shame. Uh, but I've been around it all my life, and there's people who struggle it all their lives, go to church and go to church, go to church, and they're still afraid God's mad at them, and they don't have assurance of their salvation, and they tuck their sins away, but talk about the weaknesses of others. Somebody needs to hear this today. I'm talking about the gospel. I'm talking about why it's called the good news. To some, Christianity is a big guilt trip, but God is not like that. He's all about being a part of your everyday life, not just your church attendance. God is about being close to you every day, even when you're brokenhearted, God is close to the brokenhearted. The psalmist again, Psalm 23, 4, we know this one. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. God's presence is to take away our fear, he says. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Aha, rod and staff, I knew it. God's going to nail me. The shepherd's rod was used for discipline, and a staff was to protect and to help to go in the right direction. If you are going to go off a cliff and someone wants to help you from going off a cliff, it's kind of a positive thing. Are you with me there? So God's not trying to keep us from going off cliffs because he wants to judge us and condemn us. He loves us, and he cares about us, and he wants to comfort us and help us go through and give us hope. If I'm going to have hope, I've got to see who God really is. I've got to see that he doesn't come into my life to make me feel judged. He, he wants to let me know that he really cares about me. God is not a weak God either that just pats us on the back. Oh, well, it doesn't matter what you're doing. I don't care about how you're hurting yourself or if you're hurting others. He, he cares. And he loves us so much that he wants to bring us to a new direction in our life out of, our, out of his love. Not so we can get saved. We're already in a relationship with him as believers. But he continues to bring us in that direction out of his love for our health, for our growth. And he wants you today to know you are loved so much. God wants you today. I know what... Without a doubt, God wants you to know that He loves you so much, that He has compassion for you. He understands what you're going through. In this campaign, we're walking through life's healing choices. This is what we need to do in our assemblies all the time 
not just a campaign. This is what we need to do online in our comments to one another, and I see it happening. This is what we need to do in our gatherings. I see it. This is what we need to do in our small groups. We need to remind each other all the time about the real God who really loves us. One of the biggest things we can do for each other when we gather is remind each other of who God really is in the midst of the hurts and the habits and the hang-ups of our everyday lives. In your daily life, you get beat up and you hear things that can discourage you and they hurt us and they make us afraid or they make us angry or they try to pull us in to argue, to be actually haters though we act like we're just pushing for what we believe in a truth and we're all loving and caring, but what we really want to do is argue and nail somebody because we've got the truth. We find some loophole of truth so we can argue about that and hear people pat us on the back about how spiritual we are. To find God's path to comfort and hope i got to quit being a butt kicker. I've got to be a lover and I can't do that until I see God who He really is. That he's the God of love. Number two, I got to see who I really am. You got to see who you really are. We started that last week. I'm broken. We're all broken. Romans 3 23, for how many? For all. Everybody say all. For all have sinned. Y'all quiet out there. All have sinned. Is it because I'm yelling? For all have sinned, and all, how many? All fall short of God's glorious standard. Is there anybody here that never sins? I like to ask that every now and then. Actually, I hate it. I'm so afraid someone's going to raise their hand. It's like the time the pastor said, if you never sin, please stand. And a guy stood up, and the pastor says, are you saying you never sin? And he said, no, I'm standing on behalf of my wife's first husband. Some of you are like, yeah, we've heard that one, Stan. Uh, but you help me out. As much as we know it's true, there's something I believe in every single one of us that wants to hide from the truth. I do. We want to pretend that we all got it together. That uh, we, we don't want to be honest about those cracks and those wrinkles in our life. And it's a part of the American culture. We don't want to put truth on our resume. Well, I can procrastinate. I, I tend to be a daydreamer, you know. <laughs> no, man, I'm, I'm a multitasker. And, you know, we, we, we want to hide any weakness. I spend way too much of my life, my time, and energy just hiding from the truth that I'm broken. I'm broken. Listen to this verse. It's not on your outline but it's a scary verse from Luke 12 too. But there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be made known. Tom Holliday says, that verse scares the snot out of me. <laughs> Listen to it in the, in the message paraphrase. You can't keep your true self hidden forever. Before long, you'll be exposed. You can't hide behind a religious mask forever. Sooner or later, the mask will slip and your true face will be known. It's a scary verse. And you can get the idea, like I've had in the past, that's going to be at the end of time, we're going to be in this giant arena. And you're going to be there and God's going to be pointing a finger at you. Sorry. And, uh, and, and he's going to say, you did this. This is who you really are. And everybody all around us go, ha ha, you did this. But actually, what Jesus is saying, there will come a time where everything will be known. And actually, we're going to see him as he is. And we're going to be pointing our finger at him in worship. You died for us. You saved us, O oh, Lamb of God. You saved us. That's what's going to happen. It's freeing when you let it go and you admit. I'm so thankful I get to work at a church that, that gives people the permission to be honest and it's okay to be broken. And it's a very freeing thing. We don't want to wait until the end of time to be honest. The truth is, 
uh, I'm broken. But don't stop there. I'm loved. I'm broken and I'm loved. The one who knows me best. We have close friends who know us well. It's a good, good thing if you have a friend or a spouse that loves you even though they know your faults and mistakes. Isn't it great? And that's imitating our Creator God because God knows us better than anybody. We have nothing hidden from Him and He loves us. How does God love us? He loves you like no human being has ever loved you. Human love fades. Human love can be unconditional. We've all experienced it in one way or another. Jeremiah 31, verse 3, I love you with an everlasting love, so I will continue to show you my kindness. That's why when you hear me teach sometimes, or Gina teaches, you'll hear us say, there's nothing you can do to get God to love you more. There's nothing you can do to make God love you less. I stole that from Rick Warren. He doesn't mind. He says, if my bullet fits your gun, shoot it. And when I first heard that the first time, that was the best news I ever heard in my life. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. Even with all your faults and wrinkles and struggles, there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. He's crazy about you, man. He sent his son for you. And someone has failed you. It may have been a parent. It may have been a spouse. It may have been a kid. Your kids could have been a close friend. Human love fails. And that's hard. And that's a difficult thing. But listen to Psalm 119. 76, may your unfailing love, what kind of love? Unfailing love be my comfort. Today, I'm praying that you will be comforted by God's unfailing love for you. I love when people come to church and find this out because they have the idea that church is about getting beat up and we all need love. And we all need acceptance. We're craving it. And that's why we go some of the craziest places to find love and comfort because we have this hole in our hearts and God has the answer to that. Human love is often earned. God's love is a gift. And He just wants us to receive the gift. Romans 3, 24. God in His gracious kindness declares us not guilty. He has done this through Christ Jesus who has freed us by taking away our sins. He frees us. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. That's a gift. The gift of a relationship with God. The gift of forgiveness. The gift of being in His family, having a new life, being His son or daughter in His forever family. Life's healing choices begins with this gift. That's where it all begins. Where we ask Jesus Christ into our life. Where we say, I want a relationship with you, Jesus Christ. You can do that right now if you haven't done that. You can pray with your eyes open. You don't have to close your eyes. You don't have to bow. You can say, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins and I want this gift I pl I please give me this gift of forgiveness. I take this gift. I accept it right now. Just say it in your mind. Just pray it right now. Jesus, I want this gift and I want that relationship with you through your blood that brings me as a son and daughter of God. I want forgiveness. If you haven't been baptized, you can uh, be baptized like they did in the early church. And like Jesus said, uh, just put it on a communication card that's in our bulletin and let me know you want to be baptized, we'll arrange that. You know, there's terminology in the Bible like being buried. What do you bury? You bury someone who died. And Jesus came to bring you and me new life. And baptism is a picture of that buried with Him. We rise to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 3-5. through 5. And maybe you've done that, but you've been feeling beat up. Maybe the world, the things that are going on today, all the fighting, all the arguing, all the disunity, all the hatred is causing you to lose your zeal. And today is the day to let God's love in your heart and to go out of here a new person. Maybe you're struggling in your marriage. 
Maybe one of your kids hurt you. Maybe there's something going on in your career that's hurting you, and I'm sorry about that. Maybe something, someone said something bad about you, and here's the truth. Every day of your life, no matter what circumstances, no matter what someone says about you, in, in your life, the most important truth about you is that God loves you. The Creator God, the Creator of the universe, loves you in a mad, crazy way. They would go to such extremes to give His best. I, I've got to see who I really am. I'm broken, but I'm loved. I mourn, but I'm comforted. Those who see this are on on track for life's healing choices. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You see, sometimes we have to see this in order to get good things happen in our life. We have to go through mourning. We have to have the talk to have a better relationship, and it's uncomfortable, and we mourn it. But in order to have something better, we go through something worse at first. For things to get better at work, I may need to be honest and mourn some of my weakness and to work harder and do things better to enjoy better performance. Uh, if I'm not taking care of my health, I need to be disappointed in that and, and then go from worse to better by working on it, by getting better, by asking God to help me with that. Uh, I need to feel grief about something robbing my joy in order for me to find true joy, deep joy. I've got to sometimes go through some grief and sadness. I've got to realize I'm weak in order to find strength. See who God is. See who you are. I need to see who I am in a third way. God puts us on the path for comfort and hope is to see how God can change you. To see how God can change us. Uh, we hear the word change and it scares us. And we say, oh, not now, not this. I'm, I'm already changing a bunch of diapers or I'm already trying to do this. or that. I don't have the energy. Or I've tried and it didn't work. I've tried and I've failed. First, uh, we, 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 we get this idea that, oh, I let God down. Oh, I let God down. The truth is, you're not holding God down. You can't let God down. He, he can handle himself. And you're not letting him down. Even in our verbiage, I can't change. I can't change. We're saying I can't change myself. We're trying to change ourselves. That's the problem. The power doesn't come from ourself to change us. There's a couple of verses that I have on, I have on the outline in Isaiah 40, but I want to talk about before we get to verse 31 of Isaiah 40. The chapter begins, comfort, comfort my people. It's a chapter about comfort in this, and he's, God's comforting people that have been through difficulty, and he's let them go through some hard times for discipline, and now he says, comfort, comfort my people. And he says, have you never heard nor understood? Do you not know the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows faint or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to those who are tired and worn out. He offers strength to the weak. Even youth become exhausted and young men will give up. And then verse 31, but those who wait, who wait on what? Who wait on the Lord, find new strength. What do they find new strength? Those who wait on the Lord. Not those who change themselves. Those who wait on the Lord find new strength. They will fly high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. You see, it's not all on your shoulders for you to change. It's not all under your power. Our problem is we're like hummingbirds. You ever watch hummingbirds? I love hummingbirds. They're cute as can be. But man, they flap, 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 flap. And they don't soar like eagles, do they? They flit. 
They flit about. They go to a bush. They're looking for nectar, you know, and their wings go so fast. You ever see a hummingbird in slow motion? Their wings are still fast, you know. They're so fast. They're working so hard, and we're like, I got to change. I got to change. I need this little nectar over here to change me. I'll get some hope with this nectar, and I'll get some hope with this nectar, and we're worn out. But we need to look at the passage, what it says, eagles. They'll be like eagles. Eagles don't flit. Eagles soar. They can go 10,000 feet up in the air. A hummingbird can't get above your house. They can soar, and they're hardly flapping their wings. And the reason is God designed eagles' wings to catch the updraft of the wind. And God designed your soul to catch the updraft of his love. It's not a matter of you trying to hope. It's a matter of you saying, God, I need you, Father. I'm not going to get there on my own. I surrender. I'm worn out, but I trust you. Moment by moment, I need you every day, day by day, Lord, to make me sore because I'm worn out. Listen to Philippians 2, 13, written to Christians like you. For it is God who is at work within you. Not at the church building. Not just in your prayer time. He's in all those places, but he's at work within you. Giving you the will and giving you the power to achieve his purpose. You say, I just don't really want to change. He'll give you the desire if you ask for the desire. God, give me the will the desire for your will. You say, I don't have any energy. I'm a hummingbird. Folks, he'll give you the power if you ask him for the power. God, I don't have the power to change. I'm hopeless about change because I don't have the energy to climb that hill, that mountain. God, will you give me the power? And that's where the unlocking of the prison door begins. Let's pray together. Father, I pray for anyone today that needs hope, needs comfort. We mourn over our sins. We fall short. We just, we're broken. Even though I I like being a positive person, God, and try to be the glass is half full, really this world is broken. (laughs) The glass is broken. But that's okay if we know you because you bring comfort and you bring power and you bring energy, God. I pray for anyone today worn out, God, anybody that's going through habits or hurts or hang-ups, to hear your word, to feel your love, to see the true God, to not be afraid to accept that you are the God of love and mercy and compassion. So to believe the truth of Scripture, not our feelings. I pray for us to see how we are and have the freedom to accept that we're broken and then to come to you, God, and ask you to change us for your glory. That's what we commit And we thank you for who you say we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's stand and worship God. Who am I that the highest king will welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in all his love. Oh, his love
Father, for taking us just how we are, making us your children. God, you call us by name. No matter what we believe about ourselves, you know that we are greater, that we are yours. We trust you today with our future. We give you our hearts. We praise your name for your love and your goodness. I am chosen. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Sing it again. We declare it. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say. children what a what a great song did you say own it <laughs> i love that own it <laughs> amen let's give it up for hope rising one more time Woo! for serving us and our tech team do you feel god's love today yeah. i hope you do if there's anyone new to this whole concept and you need more information feel free to email me and or call me um, you can email me at sanfredis at gmail.com if you want more verses or information on the love of god uh, and Gina, what, what's some other ways that we can experience, get connected, and talk about God's healing choices right now? By being a part of one of our growth groups. We have growth groups all over the county throughout the week. They are one hour in length. They are a short commitment since we have six weeks left, so you don't have to go till Jesus comes back if you're trying to just check one out. And they are designed for intake. So it doesn't matter that we've already started this campaign. They are going to be excited to welcome you. Amen. Yes, yes. They're geared to, to welcome. So we want you to come. And if you go to one, go, I don't know if that's the one. Try another one until you find that one where you feel connected. Kim, do we still have booklets back there? Yeah. So there's actually a booklet. You can, if you're a note taker and you like filling in blanks, you can go through the DVD that we watch during our growth group and fill in those blanks and uh, there's questions that we talk about. There's also the regular book that we're reading, Life Healing Choices. We have more of those, Kim? We do still have more of those, so get you that if you haven't gotten that, and we're reading a chapter a week. Anything else? You know, being part of a small group 
um, is one of the integral parts of being part of a family, and Amen. it's something that God calls for each of us. So we do have our growth groups. We also have a men and a women's Bible study. And our yeah. men's Bible study is here at Hope on Mondays at 6.30, and our women's Bible study is here at Hope on Thursdays at 6.30. Yes, really excited about those. Those are two groups with community. They're building community here, and it's really excited uh, journeying together. So we're thankful for those. All right. Sounds good. Time to pray for our offering. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, thank you that I get to work with people who celebrate giving because we learn from you it's better to give than just to receive. And life is not just about being consumers, but making a contribution. Take this gift as a reminder it's all yours anyway. Make us a force of hope continually on the ridge and beyond that brings you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Hey, before we celebrate our last song, what is our purpose? Building, building relationships that last forever. How do we do that? Love God. Love people. So remember, every single day this week in Christ, we always have hope. Thanks for being here. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near And I will see no evil For my God is with The light that is coming for the heart that holds on A glorious night beyond all compare And there will be an end to these troubles But until that day come We'll live to know you here on the earth And I will be no Joined us this week. We look forward to seeing you next time. And until then, we